Hi, everybody. Here I am again. And I'm promoting another thing, which is the wonderful dialogue I'm looking forward to having with Jai Dev, where we will discuss the aspect of warriorship in Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, and in, in uh, Sikhism. Sikhism, a kind of enlightenment uh, religion of its own, on its own merits, without necessarily anything from Buddhism, but perfectly leading to enlightenment, just like Buddhism, and with 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 the aspect that after several generations of leadership of gurus, after Na Guru Nanak, who founded it very bravely in the midst of the Hindu-Muslim conflict of those days, uh, uh, after three or four of them had been tortured and destroyed by Islamic rulers. Then finally, one of the gurus, I think Gobind Singh, he decided they had to defend themselves. And there's kind of a theory of that, which Jai Dev and I will be drawing on. And I wanted to say, because, you know, for example, maybe people have come to know that I'm quite excited about Ukraine. And I am that way because of my love of democracy and the democratic side and aspect of America. And also because I was thinking about Tibet and the horrible ethnocide, if not genocide, of the Tibetans by the Chinese you, through the ideological vehicle of communism, communist dictatorship, but really just a power thing. You know, a, a Chinese, there was one famous Chinese historian who had emigrated to Japan and was able to speak, speak freely, and he... He had a meeting, I think, once with, with Jiang Zemin during Jiang Zemin's tenure as the premier, as the head of China, after Deng Xiaoping. Uh, so that would be in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, the, he asked this famous guy, whose name I'm not remembering, uh, what was his capsule theory of the history of China? <laughs> he said, Churran which means eating people, <laughs> meaning that the Chinese empire expanded by devouring minorities and other tribes and other people with other dialects and languages on the boundary, the you know, so-called taming or civilizing barbarians and turning them into Chinese, synthesizing them. And uh, that's the history, it's eating people. He said. <laughs> he was, that didn't make him any more popular, of course. But, oh, you know, I realized I didn't have my mic on. I don't know if you got that. Oh, God. Let me start again. Okay. Well, I'm back. Here's Bob Thurman. I'm back again. I had turned off this microphone. So sorry. But it worked anyway. Okay. So, so anyway. So what I want to talk about and what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about from the basis of the range of the Bodhisattva a Mahayana Sutra, in which the Buddha gives, or he dialogues with actually a Jain Bodhisattva. He's a Bodhisattva who is showing the pluralism sort of integral to Buddhism anyway from the beginning. He dialogues with the Jain, someone who's a member of the Jain religion, but who is a Bodhisattva. That is to say, is a recognized person who wants to save all beings by becoming enlightened, uh, and then having the ability to save them all, and accepted as a high developed bodhisattva by Buddha. And in dialogue with him, he comes up with the theory of uh, legitimate, ethical, ethically legitimate self-defense. And what ethically legitimate self-defense is, is it is when, and the, the, the case that is discussed, and Buddha's ethical precepts are always based on specific situations. You know, because every situation is unique in a way. It's acknowledging that. And the specific situation is the invasion of your country by a power that wants to do you harm and you and your people harm and wants to, uh, you know, assimilate you. And in that case, it is ethically defensible according to the nonviolence code to defend yourself with violence as surgical as you can make it, if you have the power to do that. 
That is to say, if the enemy is sort of rashly invading you when they don't really have the ability to subdue you or people, and you can eject them in, within a reasonable period of time without too much devastation, and um, then you should eject them because that will minimize the violence of what would happen had they conquered you and then genocided you, your people. Uh, but when you have done that, you don't counter invade them preemptively. You then show them that you could, and then you impose a treaty or a, an agreement on them that they mustn't do that ever in the future and so on and so on. You know, you make your effort to get them to adopt some kind of international agreement. And uh, so that's that's the, the under which the Ukrainian self-defense is legitimate and are arming them to preserve their democracy, their effort at democracy and their overall spirit of doing that, that they had clearly had, however bad that people will say they are. Uh, they've tr been trying to do it since 20, almost 10 years now in the East Zone invasion by the Russians, by, by Putin, not really by the Russians, by Putin. So that's it. Then, then on the other hand, if you have not got the power to do that, do it because you just there. You're outnumbered. You're outarmed. You're whatever it is. You, you're just. It would be a suicide, completely suicide mission. Then you should not. And therefore, the Dalai Lama, when they were invaded genocidally and occupied by China, and he might have foreseen that it would be genocidal in the long run. I believe he did. The thirteenth Dalai Lama did, even before it happened. And uh, then you shouldn't resist violently because this will only make the occupation more violent than it would be otherwise, because you will kill some of the invaders. They'll be more angry and they'll have more, they'll feel more legitimacy in killing your people, exterminating your people. So you shouldn't, that's why he, even though the Kambas did try to fight guerrilla war, the Eastern Tibetans, the Dalai Lama didn't ask them to, he kind of admires them once they were, did it, and even they helped him to escape once they had their forces running around, not yet complete, more or less finished by them, but somewhat there, not yet exterminated. And uh, uh, But he never called the whole nation to rise. He never said this, we should do this. He never called them to rise even. He tried to get along with Mao and the generals that Mao sent to, to Tibet and so on. He tried his best to do so. And uh, finally, uh, he got, he couldn't hold it together doing it. His own people were resisting so much. He couldn't do that. So, so on this basis, there is a basis for the Ukraine to defend itself. But in that basis, actually, considering that they needed the help of NATO to do that, ourselves, and which includes us, um, when we don't give them enough to really effectively eliminate the invasion quickly, then we are putting it, we are crossing a, 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 we're into a gray area between, is it not ethical because they won't have the ability to get it done? Or was it ethical because they, 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 they have the ability to get it done relatively quickly? They had been semi-genocided by the czars. They had been badly just semi-genocided by Stalin. And Putin has already shown a kind of genocidal intent upon them. So they have every legitimacy, but they should be quick. So it doesn't go in a gray zone. And our stingy dishing out of, oh, we don't want to provoke Russia, blah, blah. Our stingy dishing out of that, just because there's mutual nuclear threat going on, we're not going to really use them, and they're not going to really use them if you're realistic. The nuclear threat is kind of an excuse. And so then we're putting them in unethical territory if we don't give them airplanes, for example, as quickly as we can, now that they need them to do their counteroffensive, where they're going on their offense against the places occupied. They need airplanes. They need air cover. They don't need the fanciest jet, but they need strong air cover. And by withholding that, under some fear that they might attack Russia, the point is, that's really, we're putting them in a bad and unethical situation. Because if we leave the Russians there, they will continue to destabilize Iran. I mean, uh, uh, stabilize uh, Ukraine, and it will never end. 
and then it becomes unethical and not nonviolent. But um, it's leading toward better nonviolence because of NATO having, and, and you can't blame us for that. Those nations on the border of Russia have been have experienced being dominated by Russia, and they didn't enjoy it, and therefore they they wanted to join NATO. They needed help to defend themselves, and Ukraine is just the latest one that wants that. So that's fine, and Russia should, and then that will liberate the Russian people from this oligarchic, CIA dominated forces. So th this li war of liberation that we are backing. Self-defense has an ethical thing in that it's also liberating, could liberate the Russian people from their suppression. They are living in fear of the KGB-dominated government. Okay? So that's what, it, that's what it is. Dedicate the merit to Slava Ukraine, to quick victory, to, to nonviolent peace for century, which will begin when this is over. And also then when China realizes they have to go into a multi-party system, when Xi Jinping himself hopefully realizes he doesn't want to go the way of Putin. Let's pray for that. Okay. Hi. Uh, this is going to be a political uh, uh, podcast, brief podcast chat by me. It's not a fireside chat. It's a mandala side chat because I'm chatting here in front of my beloved Kala Chakra mandala painting. It's a painting of the powder mandala that is actually used to initiate. But it is not a powder mandala, it's a painting one. And I had to get it in 1971 uh, when, and, and at that time there was no, this image was not known. It was not visible. It was not shareable by the twins. I had to sign a document. I wouldn't allow it to be copied and all this kind of thing to get the uh, His Holiness's monastery to lend the model that they use for making the powder one. Uh, of course, they don't put the powder on the painting. They they make geometrical, you know, foundational lines first, and then they freshly make it each time. But they did have a model, you know, to compare once they finished. And then they lent this to a painter at the Gyutu Monastery, the Upper Tantra College. And then he painted this painting for me. And I chose this particular set of deities around the painting, uh, which are unusual, we'll put it that way. And then, so I'm doing this in front of this painting, but it is political. And actually, I consider Kala Chakra to have a political dimension because. Kala Chakra puts in the East the Amoga Siddhi Buddha, which is the miracle performing wisdom Buddha. And um, it's the front face, the front blue black face of Kala Chakra. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a blue black colored um, um, uh, Amoga Siddhi, the, the, the Kirtadasana Jnana, the Jawa uh, um, Yishi. Kutanasana Jnana, uh, the gnosis that that performs miracles, which is a transmutation of the envy of the of the energy of envy, jealousy, and it's green and it's it's dark green in colors in many mandalas, but not in this mandala. Dark green is in the center actually uh, uh, of this mandala, green blue, green and blue. So anyway, in front of that, I want to do some little bit political talking because. Today, I was listening to someone that I would like to be my dear friend, whom I admire enormously, who I consider one of the great um, movie directors, movie creators on our, in our generation. You know, um, I think he's not as old as me, but close. And... Um, I mean, remarkable, I believe. And I'm, I w I've been recently, and I've, we've never met uh, personally. I've not shaken his hand personally, but we've, I've shaken his hand online and on phone because I've been encouraging him, and I'm thrilled about his wonderful documentary he just made with, with uh, Joshua Goldstein, the author of A Bright Future, 
uh, called A Brighter Future, I think his documentary is called, and it's about how we environmentalists have to brace ourselves and think critically and overcome our own slogans and realize that the nukes 3.0, 2.0, 3.0, nuclear energy 3.0, 2.0 is essential to get out of this coal and oil and gas stuff to the renew to uh, to uh, other more clean renewables than the nuke. But the 2.0, 3.0, however, are ones that are breeders, and so they don't create a lot of extra polluted stuff, but they themselves become, for 30 years down the line, they become contaminated, even the metal of them, they're solid metal. And they they don't need this old big cooling and stuff and all this complicated stuff of the of the awkward 1.0 nuclears. And, uh, but we were brainwashed against nuclear because we associated with the bomb, because we were brainwashed by the Rockefeller Foundation in the 1960s. And we think it's because that time, that with the nuclear was the Eisenhower's Adams for Peace was the, was the competition for the oil. And Rockefeller Foundation money comes from Standard Oil, remember. So they, they nixed that. They, they brainwashed us all that nu the nuclear power can't be useful. And actually it can. And it can be safe, and it is safe. Its overall record is actually quite safe, in spite of humans using it possibly badly, which they have done in the past. But even there, the record is they haven't used it as badly as they've used other kinds of bombs. They dropped a couple of bombs very criminally, in my opinion. They pretend that it solved the world war, but I don't believe that. And I think it was criminal of Truman to drop it on the civilians. I don't civilian bombing is a kind of state terrorism I consider, and I'm I'm not for it. <clears throat> and I I think we should look calmly and analytically at it and realize it is state terrorism because terrorism is defined as using violence on a on a on an uninvolved people innocent victims to get at your actual enemy who you want to fight with. So you're, you, you know, you use some innocent civilians who are not the army that you need to want to confront to terrorize the people who control the army. And so when you bomb civilians, you're trying to do, influence the generals and the defense secretaries in the country you're attacking. And the, and you are, but you are harming innocent people who did not declare war on you, and they can't resist their own people. They are just simple civilians in kimonos running around, and dropping a bombs on them is really criminal, I believe. In the, in the new century, it will be considered criminal, like the, the current Russian attacks on civilians in Ukraine. It's criminal. So anyway, he said that I consider him a, 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 an admired person and, and a dear friend. And he is an amazing, I watched an amazing interview with a wonderful uh, Friedman, uh, Le, Le, uh, Lex Friedman, uh, where after he got past the issues of Putin, who he was, I feel, deceived by, but he doesn't feel that. He feels Putin is a friend. And I know you can bond with Russians because <laughs> I have a lot of Russian friends and I happen to love the people. But I don't like dictators, I must say. And I, I, I confess, actually, my wife was annoyed with me because I did like Putin since he was at least he had a martial arts expertise during the W era when W criminally invaded Iraq. And uh, Putin, I believe, was upset about that. And I, and I considered, I've thought of him and, and the W meeting in Texas. And I sort of preferred Putin at that time because I didn't realize how, what would happen, what he would become uh, and what he was becoming already at that time. And uh, then I did. I read a Russian biography of him by Masha Gessen called The Man With No Face. And when I realized that, read that, I, I became more critical of him. And then when he invaded Crimea and then the Donbass, and then now when he's in, tried to destroy the entire Ukraine, I'm extremely uh, negative about him. 
And I feel very compassionate to him because he's causing so much damage to himself, to Russia. Everything he's tried, to, he wanted to do has been the opposite, has been achieved, and it's going to get worse. Uh, and then, um, so, but this, but what I'm talking about is actually more about Oliver, Oliver Stone, because, you know, he, he made documentaries with Castro, Putin, Maduro. He's talked to all the bad guys because like Noam Chomsky, uh, he's so appalled by the American CIA behavior since, uh, for, since ever, you know, basically since the Second World War. Although what I would like to suggest to him and uh, thinking out loud, let's say, or putting it out publicly, is that, you know, that he and Noam both go overboard about our evil. And that's, which is good. Actually, everybody should go overboard about our evil. If everybody did go overboard about the evil committed by U.S., going back to the Native American genocide, that we are built on, and therefore our other genocidal behaviors in other places, and, and violent, and and imperialist. Uh, they say, although I don't consider us proper imperialists, because we don't colonize places really very effectively. Now and then we have Guantanamo, <laughs> we have a little some corporation has a banana plantation here and there, you know. Uh, we did we did colonize Hawaii badly. You know, uh, and 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 but that was sort of part. That was just the last part of the overall colonization of the whole of the United States, <laughs> and which all the Latin American people also did. All the Spanish, English-based, French-based, Spanish-based, the Europeans did, and have colonized all of the Americas. And the, everyone in the Americas has to realize that. And the indigenous people here have to be compensated in some way. I mean, it's impossible to compensate all the terrible holocausts that occurred, but they really should be compensated. So I do understand that motive of Oliver and Noam Chomsky and other people who are radically against the U.S. all, all over the place. But I think it they get stuck then in sort of thinking there's – because, you know, nobody – it gets too hopeless, doesn't it, to say everybody's really equally evil all over the world. Uh, it seems to almost get too hopeless. It's like it's a political version of the Buddha's first noble truth or friendly fun fact, which is that the conventional world is inevitably suffering, frustrating, and imperfect, and will, everything will go wrong. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. In other words, it's a version of that, and people are emotionally hard. That fi they find that difficult, that first truth of a friendly person, noble person. They find it difficult. So then they want to say, well, maybe the Stalin was better. <laughs> maybe Putin is any this and that dictator, or China is better. You know, maybe uh, maybe they need a dictatorship in Venezuela. You know, uh, in Cuba. You know. Maybe they saved the soil from Monsanto by having a dictatorship. I mean, I mean, they get to too much glorify the equally evil people as our own evil people. So anyway, I want to go back to Gandhi. Gandhi, who had his own real politics side, even though he used nonviolence as his weapon, but he had his own real politics, although perhaps he did succeed in leading a movement that got rid of the British partially. I mean, he was partial, one cause of the success, although uh, it, was not, it wasn't unqualified. It was also the unmanageability after the war and so on. But we won't get into analyzing it, and we'll give him credit. And then he said about the uh, World War II itself that, and the rise of the fascist dictators, which was really the World War II itself, and, you know, these proud boys in America, just a little aside, who are for a new dictatorship in America, a white Christian dictatorship in America, and re-enslave everybody else and not fake, not learn their own genocide here that we have, they're ruining our lives subliminally here, and our slavery side, you know, 
and which is like an ethnocide, it has a genocidal element to it also. They don't want to face that. But what they're doing is they are betraying the sacrifices of their grandparents who fought in the World War against fascist dictators, Hitler, Mussolini, Tojo, and they are against it. And that's really ironic and sad for them. And I wish they would wake up about it and realize what America really is. So, uh, and stopped it, you know. And, um, but they haven't, I agree with the critics of America that they haven't stopped it. And, but, but back to Gandhi. In the 1938 or something like that, 37, he horrified the English press by saying that Hitler should be resisted nonviolently if people really wanted to get it over with, Hitler and Mussolini, et cetera. And that nonviolent resistance would beat them and they'd lose their power and their own countries would rebel against them. And people would be killed facing down troops and tanks without fighting back, but also not cooperating. But they wouldn't be maybe as many as are, would be killed in the actual violent resistance, which is the second option in his talk, he said. And uh, then the problem with winning by violence, which we did, we outviolence the fascist dictators, he predicted what it was that that type of Nazi person would take over our societies. So the victors would be still controlled by fascists, but then from within. So now we Americans don't, maybe a lot of us don't want to think of our CIA as fascistic types, but they are. They did recruit Nazis after the war right away. Not only scientists, but also operatives of various kinds, if you know the real story. And they and they have operated it, as Oliver is quick to say, who did film brilliant films in El Salvador and so on. They trained other countries in death squad behavior against socialists and this kind of thing. They were really very misguided. And they, they, they have taken over our society and our foreign policy, definitely. And the and the military industrial complex that the general Eisenhower warned us about, the cross of iron in his famous cross of iron speech, which is what Oliver and Noam Chomsky and these people are so upset about. And I'm upset about it too. But the point is, they also took over Russia. They also took over China. And they're still there with M6, MI6 or whatever it's called, or MI7, James Bond sort of thing. And they're still there in France, whatever their security thing is. So the five so-called victors of the World War, you know, de, somehow de Gaulle made France a co-victor, but actually we say that Bacon, the Vichy government, the French government had capitulated and were behaving like Nazis already uh, with Hitler, they're cooperating with him, but de Gaulle and the resistance, so we recognize them as co-victors because they suffered a lot. But anyway, these five have been ruining the UN because the five are controlled by Hitler-like people, which are the secret services who can kill. 007, they have license to kill in the name of the, the larger nation and do things that the, the, the ethics of the larger nation would not condone. And they and also end up suppressing in, in two out of five of the cases, suppressing democracy 100%. So they can't get voted out of power. That is in Russia and China. And uh, and then trying to even impose that on the whole world and, and argue that in a modern industrial technological society, dictatorship is essential because, because democracy is too chaotic. And this theory that the leftover of the British Empire in Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, made into a fake theory about the Chinese and which the Putin is following in the footsteps of Stalin to try to uphold that. The Russians tried to break out in the early 90s. And they did for a little while, Gorbachev and then Yeltsin in different ways. And then Yeltsin collapsed and handed it back to the KGB, which is Putin, who is the figurehead of that. And there's a whole echelon of people behind him, the oligarchs, which is KGB now in the form of oligarchs rather than in the form of spies in the back room. So 
My point is that's the enemy. It isn't just America. And therefore you don't have to pretend that some communist or some socialist is your enemy. It's not is your is your best friend. Actually, the socialists, the proper ones in Scandinavia are very good friends. Denmark, Sweden, Norway, they're relatively good friends. They are. Although they have their Nazis among them, uh, they do, right? You know, their own right wing is like, it's a little bit like that. But, but it doesn't, they hasn't had power in their countries for decades since the war. And so that's our friends. And any dictatorship is never of the proletariat, which is to say of the working people. It's always of the dictatorship because the power makes it for people crazy like that. And then our CIA operates in their critique now and then a kind of little dictatorial behavior. They lie, they get away with it, they invade countries, they do stuff. And Cheney, Bush invasion of Iraq and the destabilization of the Middle East is totally part of that. And then Obama failing to hold them to account because he was also terrorized probably by them. They probably wanted to kill him and his family if he tried to clean up after the Bush-Cheney criminal invasion, aggressive war, criminality. So I'm just suggesting that we turn our critique in all directions equally. And we pick out within the huge, the huge nations we pick out the specific people who are causing the damage. And those will be dictatorial types of fascistic types of people, inevitably. And those people we should go against. And they always try to pretend that other people are, like this, the Zelensky Jewish comedian is a Nazi. <laughs> and, you know, his, you know, his Yanukovych was the Nazi. His Medvedev is a Nazi. The other people are not. He's the Nazi, Putin, you know. They have to face that. You saw him at a time and he, he, was, he, he had a good side. Everybody has a good side. And now it's all bad and he's killing millions and threatening to kill millions more. And therefore, Biden is not like that. He did say Biden to go a long guy, which has been his history as a senator. He did vote for him. I voted for him too. I didn't want him to run even, but then I did vote for him, of course, because the other one is nothing but a Russian puppet. He's a Putin's man, you know, Trump, paid for by the oligarch, because you can pay for Trump to do anything you want. He's a money creature, and his father was a Nazi. So that, those people we can point out. So I'm just begging. I want a new documentary from the great, eminent, beloved uh, uh, Oliver uh, that really goes back to Gandhi and then recognizes that within the, the democracy, within the chaos of democracies, there is always another side which gets completely crushed once you have a dictatorship and there's only one side. And then they have to live at war. They have to live under fear. There's no way not to be afraid because they are dominating their people in a way that their people don't like, including Chinese people. They don't like to be dominated by dictators. No human being does. They will get into the authoritarian personality and they'll dominate someone under them and they'll grovel to the one above them and act like they love it but to, to get along, but they don't like it actually. So, Slava Ukraine, I'm saying, because Ukraine and our standing up for Ukraine, our democracy is standing up for Ukraine, is a kind of beginning to get back to Roosevelt, in this case, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the Human Rights Charter of the UN, which we, our CIA-dominated foreign policy, and all the other four victors of the World War of dominated foreign policies with their Security Council veto and their huge arms industries selling weapons to everybody, all takers to have wars all with each other as a big value-added industry, although ultimately self-destructive. 
we it's we're, we're the, the Ukraine battle is moving beyond that, and it's people that nobody thought would be able to withstand one of the big superpower machines did so, and given very Chinzi's help by us relative to what we could have given, which would have helped them clear out the incompetent Russian army very fast and get their land back right away if we'd given them proper support. And uh, uh, the fake thing about the nuclears is fake. Nobody knows his nuclears, and that never will happen in the future. Cannot happen. In a way, we use with the what radioactive. Uh, radioactive uranium shell casings is a kind of use of nuclear that we did, and we started doing it in Iraq, I believe. Company created by Gingrich and people like that, who are these kind of bad people that are Oliver and Noam Chomsky are after. They, those are the ones. They wish they were imperialists. They behave imperialistically around their own house. And they can be criticized and reform. we can try to reform them. And democracy does kind of reform that knocks them down. Roosevelt knocked them all down for decades and had something going for most of the people. Imperfect, always is. And Eleanor put the right of self-determination in the UN Charter for Human Rights. But the way of all our foreign policy, CIA-dominated, you know, fascist-dominated foreign policy, has prevented that from ever being enacted, and therefore, and they even when when the British Empire had to, our mentor in imperialism, had to liberate countries in Africa. Otherwise, they insisted, and Asia, they insisted that those countries keep the borders that the imperialists had inflicted on them, which, which purposely created a divide and conquer situation for different tribes that had, were not stable to be under one another, had to fight for power within a nation state that they hadn't made and hadn't asked for, or they would be not represented in the world. Uh, you know, that, they, that was enforced even after they were liberated. So it was a way of keeping the imperialist fingers on them and selling them weapons, actually, on each, to use it on each other, to hold them back, actually. Very much a Churchillian strategy, uh, which we, which we unfortunately, Roosevelt, it was like Woodrow Wilson at the end of World War I. He let the German Kaiser King resign in, with an honorable peace, but then the British made it dishonorable and trashed the whole country and the whole economy. To, which then pumped up the blowback of the next world war, the Hitler and the next world war. And w w Wilson got sick and died at the end of that and didn't see through his self-determination of people. And uh, some good friends of mine in our own diplomatically, oh, no, Bob, don't think about Wilder Wilson self-determination. Oh, no, that's so dangerous. No, no, we'll have thousands of nations in the UN. Well, that would be good. Then we'd have a chaotic democracy, which would be the UN. And that's what we should have. That's what we need to have a peaceful democracy will relatively be peaceful because people live with less fear in democracy, except for the security services can still terrify them. But if it's one, if, there, if world uh, government can enforce a world ethic between nations so that nations are not allowed to be unilaterally unethical and immoral and consider that good political science, then chaos is okay. Then it's like the Tao Te Ching. You do less from the governments because people will be more peaceful naturally. Nobody wants to park missiles in their kitchen. So, so this is my appeal for Shambhala, actually. <laughs> it is. You know, when we, when you, a great being who has said, who said in that same interview where they, they tried to defend Putin with, with, with the not real conviction, they just kept turning away from the subject and how bad America was, which they tend to do. Because you can't defend him now. Putin is going over the line, you know, long back. And uh, so, reaching out to him. He wants good in the world. We are all for good. Shambhala is a vision that there will be good on this earth 
it will be in a few centuries in the traditional texts, which I don't believe. I believe it has to be now, soon, in this century, which I think is what Dalai Lama may be saying, but he doesn't even want to talk about the Shambhala prophecy and the sort of the Buddhist Armageddon, you could say, you could call it. And it's not like the rapture of the evangelicals where they think God makes a new earth for them. It's where we clean this one up, like the Eastern Orthodox Christians, Russian Christians, Syrian Christians, Serbian Christians. We clean this one up and we, we stop wrecking it. And we take care of it and we take care of each other. And we can do that now. And we all know, know each other's needs. We have computers. We have AI even to help us do it. AI can be an immensely useful tool if we get past this conquer everybody else routine, feeling that the world is our enemy and we have to somehow, and it's dangerous and we're afraid of it. So we have to defend against it or, or aggress it preemptively and or aggress preemptively against it. We have to get past that on the individual level and on the, on the, uh, so, and this doesn't mean we have to accept some Buddhist theory. We have, the, the Christians have their own Armageddon. They just have to get a better interpretation of it. Stop thinking that Jesus is going to come back like Rambo. <laughs> the point is, Rambo will become like Jesus is rather what has to happen. Sylvester has to become peaceful, willing to let the other have the, what they need. You know? Loving the other, that means. Loving each other. That's what we have to have. Okay? So, I want, I want a new documentary on the coming of Shambhala. And, of course, I want to be a major interviewee in that documentary. I do, and I'll ha I have a few others in mind from other traditions also, the more mystical ones, Muslim. They have the Mahdi. What does it really mean, the Mahdi, or the hidden Imam? What does that really mean? Where is that? Where is Allah, Al-Rahman, Al Al uh, Allah, the, the merciful? Certainly he's not behind war. That's not merciful. Neither is Jesus, neither was Buddha, neither was Lao Tzu. So, and neither are scientific humanists who are generally open-minded humanists and not fanatic, dogmatic materialists who work for the Pentagon. Okay. Dedicate the merit of this. May we all attain the vision of the wheel of time and become wheel of time, wheels of time ourselves and thereby install everybody else in equality with us as wheels of time themselves to realize that love and bliss and kindness are the way from any one moment, from everyone now. That's apocalypse now. Apocalypse now is not dropping phosphorus bombs in the jungle. Apocalypse now is being there, caring for everyone, love everyone, telling the truth, facing the truth, and loving everyone. No way out. There's no nothing. We have to take care of everything. Thank you very much. Okay, best. Okay, bye.